Welcome, willing workers, to another lesson in our study through the book of Luke. And uh, I'll go ahead and get right into our lesson for today. It is entitled Revealed. And we're taking our lesson from uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 31. Uh, you'll see as I read through here that this is a very familiar story to all of us. And we have probably heard many sermons uh, based on this section of scripture. Our uh, theme for today's lesson is going to be Jesus reveals his identity to those seeking him. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 24 and starting at verse 13, Luke writes, that very day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened in Jerusalem. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. And Jesus said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stopped, stood still, and looked sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered Jesus, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in uh, in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said back to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who, who to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But Jesus they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. So Jesus went in to stay with the men. Uh, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus." And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he walked, while he, excuse me, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
This little town of Emmaus was only about an hour and a half walk from uh, downtown Jerusalem, so that'd make it probably six or seven miles to walk in that amount of time. And of course, we know uh, everybody walked or rode a donkey uh, back in those days. Now, Jesus uh, comes alongside and he just asks them about their conversation. And because of the question, they just stopped in their tracks. And they looked over at Jesus with sad eyes. And Cleopas, one of the two men, said, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know what's happened? It was as if they had said to Jesus, Where are you from, man? They told this stranger of the events regarding Jesus' death and his resurrection, which they had not seen. Now, Jesus didn't call them stupid or anything like that. He didn't say that they were unintelligent or uneducated. He did call them foolish ones. And in Jewish categories, the term fool does not describe somebody of low intelligence. It is not an intellectual assessment. It's a moral one. To be called a fool by God is to come under God's judgment because it is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. We read that in Psalm 14.1. Now, they did not have a poor teacher because Romans 1, 18 to 20 says that God has revealed himself clearly to every human being. That is, everybody in this world knows without a doubt that God exists because God himself has made it clear to everybody in the world. This English word translated plain in verse 19 of Romans 1, in the Greek is this word, is the word phaneros, and in Latin it is manifestum. So knowledge of God is plain. It's manifest or open to us. God has planted the knowledge of himself in our very souls and in our consciences. We know who God is, but before regeneration, we don't want to have God at all in our thinking. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, after Adam and Eve sinned, where did God find them? They were hiding behind trees. They were hiding in whatever darkness they could find. So the law of God is our biggest barrier to what we perceive to be our joy and happiness. And we want to do away with God's law so that we can have total, complete freedom. We want the freedom to do whatever we want to do, not what God commands. And so the scriptures tell us we will not have God in our thinking. The deepest and most pernicious bias is the bias against our blessed creator himself. Now, as Jesus used the scriptures, no professor had so eloquently persuasively and convincingly laid out the whole of the scriptures and summarize, summar, and a summarization of all of redemptive history. Jesus himself here was the instructor, and here's how he started. Let me tell you what scriptures say about me. Luke doesn't tell us exactly where Jesus started, with Moses. It just says he started with Moses. But because Moses was divinely inspired as the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, Jesus probably started right at the Garden of Eden in verse chapter 3, verse 15, mentioning the covenant he uh, established and uh, the sin that brought on the curse uh, of Adam, Eve, and creation itself. But he also probably went on to mention Noah, Noah in uh, chapter 9 and the covenant that was made with Abraham and how Abraham believed God and it was counted to Abraham as righteousness. 
Now, we, we read that in Genesis 15, 6. Now, where did that righteousness that Abraham got come from? Not from Abraham. He didn't have it inherently. But from the one who would come and fulfill all righteousness. That's Jesus Christ. That's why he came and lived for 33 years. Now, Jesus also uh, had to recount how God had commanded his disciple, Abraham, to sacrifice his son, his only son, the one whom he loved, Isaac. And that's in Genesis chapter 22. And when Abraham's blade was above his son's chest, ready to plunge it into the boy, a voice from heaven came saying, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham killed a ram caught in the thicket uh, beside the altar there instead of Isaac. And near that same place, 2,000 years later, God took his only son, his only begotten son, the son whom he loved, Jesus, and offered him on a wooden sacrificial altar. But no one cried out to God, stop, as God did to Abraham. Jesus had to go to Jacob, his sons, Joseph, the migration to Egypt, the enslavement of the people, and the appearance of God in the burning bush. God said to Moses, 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 put off your shoes from your feet for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground and then God commanded Moses to go to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go and of course we know the rest of that story through plague after plague after plague after plague until finally the night of Passover when God dispatched the avenging angel the angel of death, to destroy the firstborn of all Egyptians. But God said to the people of Israel, take the blood of the lamb, sprinkle it on your doorpost, and when I see that blood, my angel will pass over you. And Moses was, Moses was instructed by God to set that day as a memorial day that would be celebrated every year after that so that the people would never ever forget the exodus from Egypt. Now Jesus had to continue on through the Old Testament to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, Micah's small prophecy about a tiny village that would be the exact location where the Messiah would be born the son of righteousness that would appear in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, even to the last recorded prophecy in the book of Malachi regarding the coming of Elijah, because John the Baptist was one like Elijah. From Genesis to Malachi, the entire Old Testament, Jesus opened the scriptures to these two men, while they walked on the road. Jesus said that all these things were necessary. It wasn't an accident that Judas betrayed Jesus that night. It wasn't an accident that the bloodthirsty rulers of the Jews conspired to destroy Jesus. These things were ordained from the foundation of the world. That is, God, the Godhead, planned and agreed on everything that has occurred right up to this very minute and continuing on until this <coughs> creation has been redeemed and reconstituted in a new heaven and a new earth. <coughs> the people of God had 2,000 years of prophetic pe preparation 
but how slow they were to believe all those things that were written in the law and the prophets. Now today, we have had 2,000 more years in which we've had 2020 vision through the scriptures that tell us Jesus will return. And when he does, his return will be very fast. As they came close to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he were going to go further. But the man invited him to stay with them before continuing his journey. So they went in to stay with, Jesus went in to stay with them. As they were eating their meal, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And at that point in time, their eyes were opened and they recognized who the man was, Jesus. Then Jesus vanished from their sight immediately. And they said to each other how their hearts burned as Jesus talked to them while on the road. Now, don't miss this. This wasn't simply a matter of intellectual conviction on the part of these men. It wasn't just the setting forth of the necessary data of the content of our saving faith. There was more here than simply the engagement of the mind. The Spirit of God pierced the hearts of these men and their souls as well. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us from his word? I pray that uh, the lesson today, which is an old lesson looked at many times, has brought some new understanding to you. And I pray that in the coming week that you will contemplate our lesson today and make a commitment to live your life for Jesus Christ each and every day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and how you tell us in your word what is happening and what is going to happen. Father, may we as we read, it, read your word each and every day come to a new realization, a new understanding of what uh, your scriptures tell us. Help us to live our life for you each and every day. Forgive us our sins. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.